here. <laughs> you already know my name is Francisca Caballero and I work in the Department of Physical Metallurgy in the Spanish National Research Center for Metallurgy in Madrid, Spain. As Professor Dukuman said, I'm going to talk about design of novel high strength magnetic steels. Just let me to talk just a little bit about the place where I work. Zenin is a research institute of the National Council for Scientific Research and belongs to the area of science and technology of materials. The work we do at Zenin uh, covers from fundamental aspects to direct application, always in structural metallic materials. We have four different departments at Zenin corruption and protection, primary metallurgy, material recycling and physical metallurgy. Physical metallurgy is the department where I work. Here is a picture of the people of physical metallurgy department. Uh, there, there are different research groups that work in different research topics such as uh, processing and characterization of light alloys, composites and no composite materials, intermetallic materials, metallic biomaterials, amorphous and unstructured materials, recrystallization, precipitation, and thermomechanical treatments, and design and development of advanced steels. This last topic is the topic of material group. I work in material group. And this is a picture of the people of material group. We work mainly in five different topics. Solid, solid phase transformation in steels, modeling of phase transformation and properties, recrystallization processes, super alloys for structural applications, and advanced magnetic steel. And in this last research topic, I have focused my talk for this afternoon. I'm going to talk about high strength, high toughness magnetic steels. Okay, when I say high strength, high toughness, what I mean. I mean uh, pro mechanical properties comparable to quench and temper martensitic steels. These martensitic steels, they are quite high performance steel. To compete with them, you need a less 11, um, you need a less 1000 megapascal of GL strength, 1100 megapascal of UTS, elongation higher than 10%, like 12%, reduction in area of 50%, Sharpie energy at minus 40 degrees C of 40 joules and a fractal toughness of 125 megapascal square meter. They are really high performance still. This is a transmission electro micrograph of a conventional magnetic steels. We cannot get those properties in conventional magnetic steels. And the reason why that is not possible is because these coarse cementite particles. Cementite is quite detrimental for toughness. Then the first thing to do to get a magnetic steel in competition with quench and temper martensitic steels is to avoid cementite precipitation during the magnetic transformation. And we can do that just with the use of certain amount of silicon as a logging element. Unless we need one and a half weight percent of silicon. Silicon has quite low solubility in cementite. Then when we use silic silicon as a logging element, we can retard and even suppress cementite precipitation during binary transformation. And here you can see an example of what we call a carbide-free binitic steel in this transmission electron micrograph. You can see that the final microstructure is four bad very fine binity ferrite plates. And in between the binity ferrite plates, we have high carbon retaining austenite. There is no cementite on the microstructure. When this microstructure came along, uh, we believe that this microstructure has really high potential to compete with quench and temper martensitic steels, mainly for three reasons. First of all, we have very fine plate thinness. That's like the grain side of our microstructure. Then we will have the chance to increase strength and toughness at the same time during the material design. And also, 
because we don't have cementite in the microstructure, we can get quite nice toughness level. And also, this retaining austenite, high carbon retaining austenite, which can be a mm, mechanical sta stabilized retaining austenite, then we can increase even further ductility by transforming this retaining austenite to martensite by the drip effect. From the beginning, we believe that we have in our hands like a potential microstructure to compete with high performance steel. This is a high this is a transmission electron micrograph. I start from higher magnification. Let, let's go to lower magnification. This is a corresponding optical micrograph. Before we were looking inside those sieve of binite in the transmission electron micrograph. But you can see in the optical micrograph that between the sieve of binite we have like big pools of high carbon retaining austenite. They are called blocky retaining austenite. And this retaining austenite can transform to martensite when the steel is in service, can transform to brittle martensite and that's really catastrophic for the material. Then to make this microstructure just to compete with quench and temper martensitic steel, the first thing to do is to, to make sure that we don't have this blocky retaining austenite. We, what we should have is these oops, high carbon fields of retaining austenite, but no blocky austenite. How can we do that? The only thing we have to make sure is that we have the whole microstructure in our steel is full of the sieve of binite. We have to make sure that we have a fully binite microstructure and this microstructure is free of carbide. We can do that and we can do that just using phase transformation theory. I believe that binite transformation has been already widely described and the theory has been already said, then why don't you set to design bionetic steels? Just take advantage of that and don't go to the lab quite easily. Just stay and think for a while on phase transformation theory before to perform any tests and spend money in the lab. I'm sure that here in GIF, uh, Professor Badisha has explained to you by nitro transformation theory. I'm just going to summarize, just to remind you how the transformation takes place and what information we use to, to design binitic steels using phase transformation theory. The first plate of binitic ferrite that is for is for by a diffusion-less growth process. What does mean is that the carbon content in the binitic ferrite plate is the same than that in the parent austenite. But you should keep in mind that when we transform to binite, we are at a higher temperature than when we transform to martensite. They are intermediate temperature. Then soon the carbon is going to escape to the surrounding austenite and reach the, the austenite. And if we don't have silicon as a login element, soon this carbon will precipitate as coarse cementite, as you saw in the first transmission electron micrograph of conventional binitic steels in the form of cementite. It's what we call conventional upper binite. If we transform to lower transformation, to lower temperature, very close to the martensite transformation temperatures, all the carbon cannot escape to the surrounding austenite. And then we will also have precipitation inside the vanitiferite plates. It's what we call, call conventional lower by night. Okay, the microstructure I want to produce is a fully vanitic microstructure, but also carbide free vanitic microstructure. That means that I want to produce upper by night, then it's not going to be precipitation inside the vanitiferite plates, and I'm going to use silicon as a login element 
then I'm going to avoid precipitation between the vinitiferite plates. It's going to be completely carbide-free vinitic microstructure. Let's see how can I get that. Here, I want to get as much of vinite as possible. I want 100% vinitic steel. But can I get as much as vinite as I would like it? The answer is no, and that's because of thermodynamics. The amount of vinite that can be formed for a given steel at a given temperature is limited. And it's the, this amount is given by what we call the TO curve, which is a representation of carbon concentration in the Austin as a function of temperature when the gist free energy of ferrite and austenite is the same. You can see quite easily here in this representation. What's this TO curve mean? As I told you before, we are growing by night and we are enriching austenite at the same time. But when the austenite reaches this point of uh, this amount of carbon, we cannot go going further in producing by night. And the reason is because if we go further from here, you will get a transformation from austenite to ferrite. It's not possible by a diffusionless process. It's not possible of the same composition. Because that means an increase in this energy, and we know that that's not possible. Then, when the carbon content in the austenite reaches the TO value, the transformation stops. It's what we call the incomplete reaction phenomenon. And the amount of, of vinite that we have produced is given by this simple equation, which is just a balance of carbon. The maximum volume fraction of vinite that we form is given by the amount of carbon in the austenite according to the TO curve, the average carbon content in the steel, and the carbon content in the vinitic ferrite. That's the balance of carbon, which is 0.03 weight percent for a upper vinite, regular upper vinite. From this equation, we can figure out already what can we do in the Lloyd design to get as much as vinite as possible. The first thing we could do is just decrease the amount of carbon in the steel. We can do that. But first, I would like to see, uh, I would like to produce a high strength vinitic steel, and for that, we always need a certain amount of carbon. Let's don't do that yet. We can also, the second thing we could do is we could play with alloying elements to move the TO curve to higher carbon content and then increase the maximum volume fraction of by night that comes before. And let's see here what's happened when we do that. For uh, iron silicon carbon alloy, here you can see that we have replaced certain amount of manganese by certain amount of nickel and in that since we move the TO curve to higher carbon content. And in terms of impact properties, that means much better toughness for all the temperature tested. What is going on here, what is happening is that moving the TO curve to higher carbon content, what I'm doing is to increase the maximum volume fraction of vinite that can be formed at all the temperature of transformation to vinite, reducing the amount of blocky austenite, and controlling the microstructure through thermodynamics, and when I do that, I control toughness. Then this is really powerful. Yes, con by, phase, by phase transformation theory, I can control my microstructure, my final microstructure, and then I can control the mechanical properties yeah, without moving from the lab, from the office. And the, th the third thing that we can do is to decrease the transformation temperatures and to transform to by night as lower as we can, because when we transform to lower temperature, we have higher amount of carbon in the retinal austenite because of the slope of the TO curve. We can do that also, and we will see the results. Then, three different things to do, three different ways to, to move in the alloy design. Let's see the results. But we shouldn't, we, we will, con we will make the alloy design controlling thermodynamics, but we shouldn't forget also kinetics. Because we have to make sure that uh, during processing, for example, after forging you know, and air cooling, we will get the vinitic microstructure that we will want. We don't want to get 
of a right upper light final microstructure, then we should control the hardenability of our steel, unless to check before to manufacture the steel. And phase transformation theory is already described for ferrite formation, protectoid ferrite formation, perlite formation. We have plenty of tools to predict TTT diagrams and CCT diagrams. Then why don't use it? Let's use it. Okay. This first work was performed at Cambridge University, and that was the three first um, chemical um, composition that were proposed as a high strength magnetic steels. We propose three by the control of thermodynamics and the TO curve and kinetics, the TTT diagram and the CCT diagrams. We propose three compositions. Two of them we were two nickel steels and a manganese steel. We choose a level of carbon to get enough strength of 0.3 weight percent carbon. We select one and a half weight percent of silicon to avoid carbide precipitation during binary transformation. Manganese and nickel work for control the TTT diagrams and the geo you know, thermodynamics and kinetics. We use chromium and a certain amount of vanadium for hardenability mainly, and certain amount of molybdenum to control impurities during manufacturing of the steel and to avoid, you know, that temper embrittlement of the steel. We start from two reference steel that we knew that by isothermal heat treatment they transform to carbide free by nitic microstructure, but they were like the optical micrograph that I showed you before with blocky austenite there. The, the challenge was to get a fully magnetic steel by, for example, a continuous cooling transformation. Okay, let's see the results. These three steel were forged and after that what end cooling. No heat treatment later. Two of the three were mainly magnetic. We have also a certain amount of martensite in the microstructure. And the amount of austenite is ideal for trip effect, like 10%. And you can see that the TO curve here, as much as, as higher amount of binite is for, higher enrichment in the retaining austenite, more thermal stability and mechanical stability in the austenite. In the transmission electron micrograph of the two nickel steel, you can see that they are carbide free by nitic steels. And these are the fields, the very thin fields of returning austenite. The manganese steel was not mainly by nitic, it was martensitic. Then what is happening is that uh, the actual hardenability of this steel was higher than that was predicted. Let's see the mechanical properties of the two by nitic steels. You can see that these two blue points correspond to the UTS and the fracture toughness of the two carbide-free magnetic steels that we designed. And I compare here with quench and temper martensitic steels and maragin steel, which are really, really expensive and sophisticated. And also I compare with these red points that they correspond to other magnetic steels. From here, we knew already that we have something big in our hands because we produce two magnetic steels with a higher ever strength and toughness combination. Um, then that was really, really a success. Let's continue and see what is the next. Okay. They were nickel alloys. When you approach to industry and you saw those results, they say, okay, that's impressive mechanical properties, but nickel, nickel is expensive. Those compositions are very expensive. And I'm sure you got that toughness because of nickel. They, they don't argue about microstructure. They always talk about uh, uh, the price of that, of that Che chemical design, and they say nickel. You control toughness because of nickel. And I say, no, I can prove you that I can control toughness because of the microstructure. Just let me do cheaper steels. And that's what we do. In this 
European project in collaboration with other three um, research centers in Europe. They were KIMA, which is a Sweden um, research center, Atherlow Research, with a uh, steel producer, and Bos Alpine, also a steel producer. And our task was to, to get Nobel High Strength High Tablet Carbide Free by Nitic Steels, but this time by Hot Rolling. How this time the alloy was made? Using, like before, thermodynamics and kinetics, but this time we thought in the following way. We choose the reference uh, as a reference alloy, the nickel to steel it was the, with the one with the best properties. This is uh, the actual mechanical properties of the reference steel, the nickel to steel. And what we, we think here is that Lake made the same magnetic steels, choose very different chemical compositions, simple composition, more sophisticated compositions, and make sure that they they are the same magnetic steel. And that means, regarding phase transformation theory, the same TTT TO curve of the reference steel, and they have the same binated region in the TTT diagram. This time we didn't bore and we didn't spend so much in alloying elements to, to move the upper part of the TTT diagram quite far to increase really far hardenability because this time we were performing hot rolling and we can use accelerating cooling and then save money. But if theory works, they have to be the same still. And wherever the uh, uh, cooling schedule we use it, they should have the same microstructure. Okay, here there are the seven chemical compositions that have the same TO curve than the reference steel and the same binated region in the TTT diagram. You can see that the first one, for example, is very simple composition, very cheap composition. We keep, in all the cases, the same amount of carbon, 0.3 weight percent, the same amount of silicon to avoid cementary precipitation, 1.5 weight percent. But this time, we use mainly manganese instead of nickel. I designed two nickel alloys to prove them that even they have nickel, they don't need to have better toughness properties. We can get the same toughness properties or even much better using manganese if we control the microstructure. Nickel doesn't give you the toughness per se. Chromium again for hardenability and certain amount of molybdenum to control impurities. And these last three still, they are a little bit sophisticated because of the addition of cobalt and aluminum. Here, we add certain amount of cobalt and aluminum to refine the binitic microstructure. We knew from former work in high carbon, high silicon, binitic steels, that using cobalt and aluminum, we can refine the binitic uh, ferrite plates. And we use it just to check if we can get higher strength. This time we perform a hot rolling simulation, quite conventional hot rolling simulation, and after finish it we perform accelerating cooling. And we try different cooling schedules. In some cases we perform coiling from different temperature, and in other cases we perform air cooling also from different temperature. We will have different microstructure for each of these steels you will see now. This is a summary of the microstructural characterization of all the microstructures. Um, in red, I remark those microstructures which were successful because they were fully binitic steels with a volume fraction of by nine higher than 70%. And you can see that we got a uh, carbide free vanity microstructure in all the steels. In all the steels. At the beginning, it was not easy to get magnetic microstructure after coiling. They perform quite high coiling temperatures. And then we got a lot more ferrite. But by the time we got a fully magnetic microstructure after even coiling from a regular temperature as 500 degrees C for the thenin 6 
steel. In the thinning 7 steel, which is the one with a higher amount of halogen elements, we didn't get a fully vinitic steel, but you can see that it is mainly vinitic, it's 60%, about 60%. I would like to remark, for example, this microstructure, which has not martensite, just is mainly vinitic, and still have quite nice amount of austenite for control of trip effects, and very high amount of carbon in the retaining austenite. Um, that's, that's the most we got in, in the seven still, and it was not really hard task, just using phase transformation theory. Let's see some micrographs. This is the low magnification micrographs. This is for thinning two, air cooling after accelerating cooling from different temperatures, and they are fully magnetic, completely fully. And let's see the transmission to see if we have cementite or not. You can see that there is no cementite in the microstructure. All you see there is by ferrite plates and high carbon retaining austenite. And here, this is a graph that tells you that, that the design procedure using phase transformation theory work perfectly because this is the amount of, of bionite in the reference steel and we got the same microstructure from very different steel and very different chemical composition from very different cooling schedules. That means versatility in your material. Industry love that because sometimes you cannot control strictly the conditions and this means really sex for application. Just using phase transformation theory. That's the, the nice thing. Okay, let's see some mechanical properties. The UTS we got in the seven steel range from 1600 megapascal to 1900 megapascals with a total elongation higher than 10%, which is really nice. And a Sharpie um, uh, properties at room temperature comparable to um, quench and temper matensitic steel. And see something here. Thenin 7, the steel 7, which was with cobalt and aluminium, higher strength, that's the refinement of the binitiferite plates. Cobalt and aluminium is playing the role that, that we suppose is going to play. I have not checked yet the binitiferite plates actually, but I, I believe that the higher strength is because of that. And look here, impact energy, blue, the one with nickel, and it has not the highest toughness. You can get in very, like, thenin 3 in very easy co composition with manganese, just manganese, in a level lower than two and a half weight percent, uh, higher, higher toughness than in, in a steel with nickel. We prove to, to some industrial people that it's not as easy as nickel make toughness good, it's as easy that please control your microstructure and you will get the properties you want. Okay, next thing to do. I told you that decreasing the carbon content, we can increase the maximum volume fraction of by night. But also we have to do it because of weldability. All three weight percent carbon is quite high if you want to weld your steel. Then the next thing we, we have to do is to decrease the carbon content in the steel. But we didn't get so, that didn't get so much work to do because look here. Oops. Thenin 1 and Thenin 3, the same halogen elements just decrease the carbon content. I was not worried when they asked me to decrease the carbon content because I have higher strength that I, I needed to compete with, you know, with high performance steel. If I decrease the carbon, I'm sure it's going to increase the utility and then everything was easy. Don't move any halogen elements because if you move the carbon, the curve is going to be the same. And I can increase even further the volume fraction of binite if you remember the simple equation of carbon balance. I just check for the hardenability of the steel and I keep in mind that it should decrease. But time at the binating nodes in the TTD diagram doesn't change. BS and S temperature also increase. That, keep that in mind for the low design. But no, no difficult, just decrease the carbon content. And see the results. This 
is the summary of the microstructural characterization. And look, before 80%, we are 90% is fully magnetic. There is no martensite anymore. And we got that after cold rolling, accelerating cooling, and air cooling from two different temperatures. Here, coiling didn't have sex, but it's because 400 degrees C still is low, but it was not low enough. We should still continue working on the coiling. We know that. And, but I think that people at Atherlor can manage, and in the future we will get that. That's nothing that it really worries so much. And the amount of austenite still very nice for triple head, and the amount of carbon in the austenite. And look, I don't have mechanical properties of those steels, but the hardness is over 400. We decrease the hardness from 500 when we use 0.38% carbon to 400, but the strength was higher than 600. This is still, I am sure, will have really nice mechanical properties. For this reason, okay, let's see the micrographs first. This is the corresponding transmission electron micrographs, fully binitic and carbide free binitic microstructure for the two 0 0.3, 0 0.2 weight percent carbon steels. The results of this European project was really, really promising. We got very high strength. Now we have to work in ductility and informability to move for forward. In which direction we want to move? Before we wanted to do as a steel as good as quench and temper martensitic steels. Now we want to do as a steel as good at steel as good at three steels. Why not? Just work on the ductility and formability. We can decrease the carbon for weldability. That is not a problem. And we are performing. We are working with very cheap steels, why not? Let's move in that direction. And, and now we still four partners, um, Kimap, Atherlor, and Sidenor. And this is a new proposal for the European Commission for this year. OK, and I told you there are three things that we can do. Just the last one, decrease transformation temperature. When in the TO curve, we can see, because of the negative slope, that when we transform to lower transformation temperature. We can get higher amount of carbon in the return in austenite and then higher volume fraction of binite. But how, how should we make our steel to transform to lower transformation temperature? Just by alloy design. Still using thermodynamics and kinetics, still using phase transformation theory. And look to these results. With carbon, I can, in this alloy, 2% silicon, 3% manganese, we decrease BS and MS temperature. Increasing carbon content, we transform to binite and lower transformation temperatures. This is the effect of manganese and nickel. And from here, we know already that we should play with carbon in the alloy design. It. Because, look, it will be nice to play with manganese and nickel instead, but at the end, BS and MS collapse there is no possibility to transform to binite. Then, the first we did is just to increase the carbon content. Before we decrease, now we increase. And we increase very high amount of carbon contents because we want to transform to very low transformation temperatures. Alloying elements, if you, remember, if you could remember, they are very, very similar to the first and successful manganese steel. They are completely the same. Yes? higher carbon content. And when we transform, for example, this steel at 200 degrees C, the BS temperature of this steel is like 350 degrees C, and that MS temperature is like 125 degrees C. When we transform at 200 degrees C, and we transform to a fully binitic steel, this is the hardness. 0.2 weight percent carbon, 400 beakers. 0.3 weight percent carbon, higher than 500, 650. This hardness is the hardness that we always see in martensitic steels, no in binitic. This is the highest ever hardness for binitic steels. And look to the GL strength and the UTS. Very, very high, high uh, strength. But why so high? Which is different in the microstructure. Let's see a transmission electron micrograph. And let's compare with the first we saw at the beginning, the, the 
high silicon bainitic steels. And if you see here, this bainitic ferrite plates has a thickness of 0 0.2 or 0.3 microns. Here, this bainitic ferrite plate has a thickness of 20 nanometers. Increasing the carbon contents, we decrease the transformation temperature, and decreasing the transformation temperatures, we refine to a nano scale over by nitty microstructure. The microstructure is still the same by nitty ferrite plates and high carbon retaining austenite. But the scale is nano scale. Okay, let's see the low, the low magnification microarrays and the evolution of the microstructure as a function of time when we transform oops, one of the steels, high carbon, high silicon steels at 200 degrees C. After one day of transformation, bionite is not there. This is martensite and retaining austenite. We should wait at least two days to get a significant amount of carbide-free bionitic steel, bionite. Four days, increasing, still increasing the amount of bionite, and six, six days is already fully bionitic. You can see here the evolution of the microstructure and the amount of uh, retaining austenite in green and bionite in red. At six days, the microstructure is fully bionitic. And after 10 days, it's still the same microstructure, we get you know, the saturation of the transformation. See the evolution of the, of the carbon content in the bionitic ferrite and the austenite as the transformation takes place. In Greece, you can see, as we explained at the beginning, when we increase the volume fraction of bionite during the transformation, we get the austenite richer and richer until we get that TO curve. But the first thing surprised us when we saw this X-ray analysis results is that the enrichment is not too high. This is atomic percent. We are not quite familiar, but I can tell you that this is like one and a half weight percent carbon after the transformation finish. It's not very high. We start from 0.8 weight percent carbon. For 0.3 weight percent carbon of average carbon content, the enrichment was like to one weight percent. It doesn't look like so much enrichment during the transformation. And there is something that also is different than in medium carbon steels. It is the amount of carbon in the bionitic ferrite during transformation. This is atomic per se, but I can tell you that this is 0.3 weight percent carbon. According to paraequilibrium, it should be 0.03 weight percent carbon. So much carbon for bionitic ferrite. Why carbon doesn't enrich the austenite, doesn't escape the austenite? But there is other question that we can that has been transferred at 200 degrees C, and there is no carbide there inside the vanity ferrite plate. It's not lower by night, and we are at 200 degrees C. There is no enrichment, as much as enrichment that we expect to the retinal austenite, but there is no precipitation, then something should happen during the transformation. Okay, first we check the amount of carbon we check those X-ray analysis results with 3D atom proof. And you can see here, for one of the stills transferred at 200 degrees C for six days, this is our sample, 3D atom proof sample, which is a needle, and we are looking at the tip of the needle. In 3D atom proof, we don't have crystallographic information. That means that we don't see FCC phases or BCC phases to see we are looking at austenite of bionite or ferrite. But we detect, this is a um, carbon atom map. We can detect quite rich regions in carbon and quite poor in carbon regions. The amount of carbon here is higher than the average carbon content of the steel. The only thing can be is retaining austenite. The amount of carbon here is very low, much lower than the average carbon content, then this is ferrite. We are looking at the austenite ferrite interface. And here we can also uh, represent it like a two, five, and eight at, um, atomic percent isoconcentration surface to look clear 
to the interface. And we analyze also the concentration profile of different elements as carbon, silicon, manganese, and chromium across, in this volume, across the interface, perpendicular to the interface. Here, we can measure the carbon content in the austenite, and I can tell you is very similar to that we measure in the X-ray analysis. And this is the carbon content in the ferrite that I can tell you that it's slightly lower than that we measure in the X-ray analysis. But this is local information. X-ray analysis is global information, average information. It's lower, but still much higher than the parequilibrium value. And something else, to, something else that we can see here is that there is not partition of other element, alloying element, a part of carbon during the transformation. Thus, proving that phase transformation, binary transformation theory has been well described. Okay, this is a transmission electron micrograph of a plate of binitrous ferrite growing inside the austenite. We are at the beginning of the transformation, and you can see the high dislocation density in the near to the interface, austenite, ferrite interface. This is related to the plastic flow that takes place during the binitic transformation. We believe that this, lo this location should play a role here because as lower the transformation temperature is, higher amount of dislocation we will have in the material. And then maybe something getting different than for medium carbon binitic steels. And then we, we detect, we catch a dislocation, a skewed dislocation by 3D atom proof. That's not an easy task to do. We could do it because of that 3D atom proof we, we use it, which is a LIAP atom proof, local electron atom proof, that you can get a very high amount of, of atoms uh, to, as a result of that 3D atom proof analysis. Um, but we, we got it, and you can see here, this is high carbon region, this is austenite. Here is quite low carbon region, this is ferrite. And here you can see like interface, and quite close to the interface, there is this feature that I isolate here. And you can see in the five atomic percent is a concentration surface. This is a dislocation. And that was the first time that uh, someone has looked to the chemical analysis of dislocation in by needing microstructure and look that we got. We got segregation of carbon in dislocation. We are looking at what we call cultural atmosphere in binitic microstructure. But if we saw a dislocation it's because it's segregated in carbon. We cannot see in 3D atom proof dislocations if they are not segregation because we don't have crystallographic information. We saw it saw it because it's enriched in carbon. And here you can see that the only element segregated on the lead location is carbon. We measured the amount of carbon in the dead location and it's like 7.4 atomic percent carbon. And the extent of the cultural atmosphere is like two and a half nanometers. Okay. Here you can see the concentration, carbon concentration profile across the dislocation. And you can see the extent of the cultural atmosphere, and also you can see slightly depletion in carbon near to the austenite and the dislocation, as Callis and Cohen described a long time ago from Martin Sand. Okay. But we also saw different defects, like which was really interesting to see these micro -twi twins. I would like you to see this very fine scale of enrichment like here, you see. We believe they are micro twins also related to the plastic flow in the austenite during binary transformation. But maybe we should look more carefully to this in the future. We didn't success to do to get cementite precipitate to see cementite in the a low temperature by needing microstructure we got after an extensive characterization in transmission electron micrograph. For longer heat treatments, like here, I got some cementite I could see in the 3D atom proof, and here you can see very fine plate of cementite precipitate in the ferrite, like lower by night. Um, 
And we know that this is cemented because of the level of carbon in 3D atom proof it you detect almost 25% atomic percent of carbon that's cementite. To be epsilon carbide, it has to be higher amount, like 30% of carbon. And it, we know from here that this is paracementite. No other alloying element partition during cementite precipitation. All this 3D atom proof work has been done in a CER project with Orrich National Lab in collaboration with Dr. Miller. Okay, but we were talking about days to get this steel, like six days to get a fully binitic steel. We cannot produce this yet by continuous cooling. It will be really, really nice. We should uh, accelerate the transformation, and we can do that using a game phase transformation theory. You can see here that adding cobalt and aluminium to the steel, cobalt, we found that increase the driving force for the transformation. You can see that we can speed a little bit the transformation and that instead of days, transformation takes like some hours. Still far from continuous cooling, but getting closer. Also, we can increase refining the prior astronaut grain site. That's the second thing to do. Okay, and some mechanical properties of these low temperature magnetic steels. You can see UTS and fracture toughness. This is was the medium carbon magnetic steel, the two nickels. This is the high carbon, high silicon magnetic steels comparable to quench and tempers. And even and here in comparison to other steels, this is the yield strength and the total elongation. They are really high performance magnetic steels. Okay, and just as a summary, just to say that before to make casting and thermomechanical simulation, please sit on the office and think about all the information we have on phase transformation theory and the description of ferrite, perlite, martensite, bionite transformation and use it for alloy design, which is really, really useful. And I think that this work proved that it's a powerful tool to use it for material design. And just for finish, just to say that thanks to all these people, to Professor Badicia, because everything I know from by night came from him, to Dr. Miller, because he has helped me with a 3D atom proof. I couldn't do this work without him, to Thierry Yun from Atherlor, because he he has made the Lois I has proposed, and that like make your dream true to have the material in your hands. And also to Dr. Garcia Mateo and Dr. Santofimia for helping me in all this work. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, very impressive uh, micro structure there. Thank you. Um, good. So I think we can uh, perhaps uh, have some questions. Take some questions. Yes. Yeah, during the atomic simulation, which kind of potential is you? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Is that During the atomic scale simulation, which kind of potential did you use? Atomic simulation? That was 3D experimental results, atom proof. Uh, experimental atom proof? Not yeah. No, 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 no. That's, yeah. yes, that's so, that still how it looks in the 3D atom proof. Maybe you can explain how the uh, 3D atom probe uh, works. Uh, I think, so are you going to do it? Yes. Carlos will do it, oh, and okay. I'm sure he will do it more than me, but much better than me. Yeah. So it's a very interesting piece of equipment. It looks like it's been modeled. <laughs> 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 they are actual atoms. <laughs> yeah. Actual atoms. Any uh, other questions? Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a missing part of the story okay. because uh, the industrial partners actually first ignored the theory and made some alloys which didn't work and then they asked for your help. Okay. <laughs>
do you think the um, additions of um, one and a half percent chrome and about a half or point twenty five percent moly are essential? Uh, I just use it to be safe, but I wanted to to try without them. If I should talk longer with producers and if if they ensure me that they can control impurities without this molly, I can take off. It is not essential for the microstructure. Of course, it's included in the uh, thermodynamics and kinetics modeling, but if I take out, I should check the other halogen elements because everything is together for controlling thermodynamics and kinetics. But I can, des I, I can design for example, it's so easy. In this, oh, where is it? What is the, okay, here. In, I can tell you how it's going to look, the chemical composition. Here, for example, in this, very simple. If I take this, maybe this will increase a little bit. But, you know, if it is lower than two and a half, if, Industrial like it, industry like it, but it will be a little bit higher. If someone tell me I can control impurities, don't worry with Molly de Noon. I can control impurities perfectly during, you know, the processing. I, I don't need to to have it. And then this amount is going to be higher, but not much higher. This is really, really, really very nice chemical composition. So simple. But look how it is working. If I use chromium, I decrease manganese. They are completely related. And I, I know the equations, they're related. But you know, that's just by myself, because they don't have so much information. But it's thermodynamics behind and kinetics. But look how it's working. Oops. If I use chromium, I can decrease manganese. If I want to decrease further, I should increase chromium. I just can figure out with, you know, it's like a, to design. It's like when you go to a restaurant and choose a menu. And you, you can have dinner, whatever you like it. Here it's like that. Yeah. Just, just tell me if you prefer manganese or chromium or not. Yeah, yeah. Because you look yeah. to, the, to the versatility of the chemical compositions. This chemical composition regarding microstructure is exactly the same that this is which is more sophisticated. I know, of course, that there is no cobalt in the earth to make steel symptoms, but, but that was for scientific purpose. Yeah, yeah I think the, the cobalt route is... Uh, <laughs> kind of expensive. What about the aluminum here? Uh, do you think it might be interesting to look at uh, just aluminum. I, okay. Like, for instance, uh, sodium yeah. three with, with aluminum only. Okay. The thing that, is what that. Your opinion on that. Yeah. What we can do next is just do like it has been done with three steels. If you don't like it, one and a half percent of silicon. There are plenty of work in in three steels to control the the surface finishing. Yeah. Then we can do next the same, but. It has been already in papers. That's not difficult to move in that direction. Here, but here we have aluminium and silicon at the same time, and you can say it's always in trip that when you you add both of them, it has to be one and a half weight percent. You know that, right? Yeah. Here is like two and a half. I add here aluminium because of the plate thinness refinement. Yeah, the, the transformation. Yeah, I didn't worry about of the silicon here, but we should check. If mm, just with the amount of aluminium plus silicon that used in trip, you can get the extra refinement you want. That's something else that can be done. Okay. We don't talk very much about low temperature transition carbides. Do you mean epsilon carbide and cementite transition? Eta carbide or epsilon, so the low temperature, the 200 degree carbide. Okay, okay, let's uh, talk a little bit if you want. Okay. Here in the 3D atom proof, yes. one of the last. At, at the beginning, when we did all the transmission electron microwave examination, no carbides were found. Yes. I just found, I think, two of them 
by replicas, but it was so tiny. I just two. I couldn't believe it. You cannot say this is lower by night if you just find two of them in one very, you know, thin foil or in a, but in 3D atom proof, I don't know why. I, I was, it was easier to find it. Even you were looking at more tiny volume. I was really surprised, but I found more of them. And this is the case. The case, the only carbide I have seen in different occasions in this material, low temperature magnetic steels carbides. But all the time it has been cementite. I have not seen yet epsilon carbide during binite transformation. I can see it during tempering, but not during binite transformation. And in my opinion, I agree with Professor Badisia and his work he made in medium carbon, high silicon steels, that the carbide from, for lower binite is the cementite. And this must be related, I don't know, I want to check it in the future in a new uh, cell project I have with Ori National Lab to check if this is related also to the dislocation density, the dislocation we have in the microstructure, and if there is a way that this location is trapping carbon, and even when you have very high amount of silicon, you don't get epsilon carbide, it will be the expected precipitate. You always get cementite. He, your argument was in the past that this is because of the location density. It had no be test, has, has it. What I wanted to, to test it, that was the first thing it was done. And also I want to, to see, because this is high carbon, but I want, and here we know that we have carbon segregation in these locations. But what I want to do now is to do the same work in medium carbon stills, where the level of this location should be the regular that we have been playing all the time. Is there segregation of carbon in those dislocations? Is preventing the precipitation of epsilon carbide, you know what I mean? Precipitation should be studied, at a, in my opinion, at atomic scale for precipitation during lower binite transformation, for precipitation in low silicon binitic steels, and also in precipitation during tempering. And that's in the direction I would like to move in 3D atom proof. Would you still say that the volume fraction is incredibly small? The volume fraction of cementite? Yeah. I would say so. Yeah, I, I think I found, because I looked to the side of the cementite, which is, they are like 10, 10 nanometers, but the, the, the plates of binitic ferrite, they are 20. If they were there, it would be like over the side of the plates. That this cementite particle it should be in a higher plate. But higher plates is like less constrained and less. Do you know what I mean? Longer distance. Between. Yeah. And that means less strength in the arterial and austenite, less flow, less plastic flow, less. What is the carbon concentration around the ceiling? You, you can see here. You can see here. Do you see yeah, in the interface? Okay. I think that was a big plate of binitic ferrite. But when you have 20 nanometers like, like here, I think there is no way to precipitate there. I don't know if it is because there is no room. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I will look at that way in a simple way. <laughs> It's, it's a very exciting area of research because many things are starting to appear uh, which previously people just couldn't look at. This, this is now you know, the atom probe of today allow us to you know, see things that, was not of, that were not available in the past. But it's essential to thread very carefully when we in, give interpretations. And, one of the reasons being, of course, the, the mass we're looking at, you know, and you know, so we always have to look at different scales to make sure. Yeah, I would say that. Know, anyway, I always look at things, in particular your work, as uh, you know, the technical potential and then the very interesting scientific discussions we can have at, in parallel. I, I think that to go to a 3D yeah. atom proof, you have to know your material very, very well, and it should be some in the transmission for long before to, to go to a 3D.
you can pop in, you can pop these needles in in a TM, right, and look right through them, right? Is there not? They are nothing foils. Is what you mean? I foils. think there is no hole they're, there. They're, oh yeah, they're not foils, but you can look through the, the you can look through the tip in a TM. Look, it's like 20 nanometers. Yeah, I know. Mm. As, long as, 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 as long as you have yeah, that holder, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe yes. a few nanometers yeah. 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 Mm. Okay, uh, any qu uh, questions from the audience? Can you go to the slide? To where? Yeah, to the uh, showing the twin lines of oh, the, the localization. Micro twins? Yes. That's nothing we are sure yet, but we can talk about it if you want it. I don't know why, why <laughs> it happened. Because the carbon localization, wh 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 why does it happen, actually? Why it yeah. gets segregated in yes. carbon? It is, it is far away from the boundary between ferrite and austenite. We are not looking here at a boundary. It's looking here to different, as, as the only, if we don't get into the micro twins um, conclusion, the only thing we can say that if this is retaining austenite because of the carbon content, and that we have like this enrichment. Why this enrichment is for? We conclude that that can be micro twins. Micro twins can get segregated in carbon as dislocation and cotton atmosphere. And we thought that we know also that mm, retaining austenite uh, can get a twin during binary transformation because of the plastic flow. Then we came with that conclusion, but it should be look carefully, I have to say. Okay. Okay, I, I thank you very much. Thanks to you. And I propose we, uh, we stop here, take a rest, uh, <laughs> and uh, before we move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>